We welcome you to worship at Mount Washington Baptist Church, our first worship service for 2021. We invite you to take these next few moments to prepare your hearts to worship the Lord as we listen together to the prelude. is the first Noel based on Luke 2. There were shepherds in the fields keeping watch over their flocks at night. Looking up and saw a 
Sunday. Welcome to Mount Washington Baptist Church online ministry. We are a family in ministry. I am so excited to be in the new year. Happy New Year 2021. So what are your New Year's resolutions? Let us resolve to be closer to our Lord. Let us resolve to spend more time in his word. Let us resolve to spend more time serving him. And Lord, we know that serving you means serving one another. So let's resolve to spend more time with our fellow, fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, Lord, we give you this year and we just pray to see your glory. Lord, we just, all things that happened this year, we want to sing your praises over. So Lord, thank you for a new year. Be sure to reach out and tell everyone Happy New Year. And Lord, help us to resolve to be closer to you. Have a great Sunday. Bye. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem during the reign of King Herod, Magi came from the east to Jerusalem and asked, Where can we find the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw a star in the sky that signaled his birth, and we have come to worship him. Herod was disturbed when this news reached him, so he met with the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star appeared. Pretending that he also wanted to worship the child, he sent them to Bethlehem with instructions to report back when they found him. They resumed their journey, following the star, until it stopped over the place where the child was. Overjoyed to find the child with his mother, they kneeled and worshipped him. Then they gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But when they left, they returned home by a different way because they had been warned in a dream not to report back to Herod. Stop. 
Give thanks to the Lord, call on his name. Make known among the nations what he has done. Sing to him, sing praises to him. Tell of all his wonderful acts. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord in his strength. Seek his face always. We praise you, Lord, for all you are, for all you have said, and for all you have done. We thank you, Lord, for this new year. And we pray your blessings upon our families and our congregation as we seek to serve you in 2021. We intercede, O oh Lord, for our nation and our world. We ask that you would bring an end to the pandemic. We pray for healing for those who have the virus. We pray for comfort for those who have lost loved ones. We thank you for your many blessings in our lives, and we ask for the forgiveness of our sins, and we thank you for your grace and your mercy, which makes our prayers possible when we ask for forgiveness. Thankful are we for the many blessings that you've poured out into our lives, for the opportunity to live this new year. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would bring comfort to the Calico family and the passing of Jan's sister-in-law. We pray for healing for Diane Steelman. We pray for healing for Christy Earle. We pray for healing for Linda Oliver. We pray for healing for Chris Wagner's brother-in-law, Jerry, as he recovers from bypass surgery. We pray for healing for Chris's mother, Lydia, who's experiencing kidney problems. We pray for healing for Christine Walter's daughter, Janie. We pray for healing for Christine's sister, Perlina. We pray for healing for Kathy Heron's mother-in-law, Bonnie Heron. We pray for healing for Bonnie's daughter, Marsha Lee. We pray for healing for Fred and Mary Lou Newman. We pray for healing for their great-granddaughter, Addison. We pray for healing for Mary Lou, who is being treated for a blood clot in her leg. We pray for Fred, who has been diagnosed with ILD. We ask for the healing of his lungs. We pray for healing for Lindsay Pertuset from cancer. And we pray for healing for her husband, Tom, as he recovers from a fall. We pray for healing and protection for Eileen Jelson's dad, Richard. We ask your comfort to be with the family of Nadine Gelter. We pray for healing for Becky Tichy. We pray for healing for Julie. We pray for safety and protection to be with Chrissy Bartholomew. 
We pray for healing for Corinna Frazier's husband, Jason. We pray for healing for Martha Goebelberg's father's friend, Marion, who has COVID. We pray for healing for Joan Eisenbraun. We pray for healing for Gabriella Atchison. We pray for healing for Carly Atchison's mother, Gina. We pray for healing for Luke Goodman's father, Scott. We pray for healing for Luke's mom. We pray for healing for David Thorman's brother, Paul. We pray for healing for John. We ask your grace to be with Tim Reckle in his job search. We pray for healing for Shirley Smith. We ask your comfort to be with Charlie and Lynn Saulberger in the passing of Lynn's brother-in-law, David. We pray for infant Tali, born at 25 weeks with stomach issues and fluid on her brain. We pray for healing for Sid Green. We pray for healing for Maxine Racer. We pray for healing for Joyce Branding's brother, Tommy. We pray for healing for Joyce's cousin, Bob. We pray for healing for Joyce's sister, Barb. We pray for healing for Susan Lotterulo's friend, Mary, and her husband. We pray for healing for Amy Bono's friends, Jim Hunt and Chris. We ask your protection to be with Tony Bono's mother, Anna Mae, in the retirement home. We pray for healing for Bonji and for Queen. We ask your protection to be with their children. We pray for healing for Iris Oliver. We pray for healing for Patty Ocker. We pray for healing for Thomasina Baker. We pray for healing for Jody Gibson. We pray for healing for Calvin Gibson. We pray for healing for Judy's cousin, Janice, and her daughter, Jenny, who are both battling cancer. And we ask your grace and peace to be with Judy Grissom. We pray for healing for Rob Clark. We ask your healing to be with Lisa's friends, Beverly Palmer, Cheryl Young, and Dave Perry. We pray for healing for Rita Hoder's grandson, Dane, and for Rita's brother-in-law. We pray for healing for Kelly Ferguson's parents, Norma and Dwayne. We pray for healing for Katie Bartmas. We ask your protection to be with the Bartmas' niece, Julie, who's working as a nurse to COVID patients in Butte, Montana. We pray your protection for Bethany and Brad Schultz, who are in high-risk jobs. We pray for healing for Jim Bartmas. We pray for healing for Karen's brother, Lee Kuhn. We pray for healing for Melba Smith. We ask your grace, O Lord, to be with our shut-ins. We pray blessings over Jan Calico, Verla Crowder, Ann Evans, Mona Hausman, and Barb Lurdy. We pray for our missionaries. We ask your grace to be with Aaron and Valerie Osterbrock. Please bless them as they prepare to turn to Malaysia next year. We ask your grace to be with us as we pray in the name of Jesus, the words he taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you.
Jesus in the temple. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up according to custom. And when the feast was ended, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know it, but supposing him to be in the group, they went a day's journey. But then they began to search for him among their relatives and acquaintances. When they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem searching for him. After three days, they found him in the temple sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And he said to them, why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? And they did not understand the saying that he spoke to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. In Luke chapter 2, we read about Jesus going to the temple with Mary and Joseph for the festival of Passover. When they left to go back to Nazareth, he was no longer with them. And then they later found him in the temple courtyard with uh, wise people talking about the scriptures. In verse 48, it says, when his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. He's 12 years old and he's frustrating his parents. And it makes us think about young people and how they develop. In a 2011 article in National Geographic, these questions were asked, why do teenagers act the way they do? The article implies that gaining insight into the huge changes in a teenager's brain could help parents understand their children's unpredictable moods and behaviors. It also shows why parents need to provide firm but loving guidance during this critical phase of development. The article states, the first series of scans of the developing brain show that our brains undergo a massive reorganization between our 12th year and our 25th year. The brain doesn't actually grow much during this period, but as we move through adolescence, the brain undergoes extensive remodeling, resembling a network and wiring upgrade. When this upgrade to the brain is finally complete, the entire brain will work much faster. It will also enable young adults to balance impulse, risk, desire, and personal goals. But the article warns, but at times, especially at first, the brain does this work clumsily. It's hard to get all those new cogs to mesh. These studies also explain why teens behave with such vexing inconsistency beguiling at breakfast, disgusting at dinner, masterful on Monday, sleepwalking on Saturday. Along with lacking experience generally, they're still learning to use their brain's new network. Stress, fatigue, or challenges can cause a misfire. A psychologist who studies teens calls this neural gawkiness, an equivalent to the physical awkwardness teens sometimes display while mastering their growing bodies. In today's story, Jesus Christ is 12 years old. He's one year away from accountability as a Jewish boy. Joseph and Mary made the trip from Nazareth to Jerusalem for the festival of Passover. There were three festivals celebrated in Jerusalem, 
Feast of Tabernacles, Feast of Pentecost, and the Feast of Passover. Passover celebrates the Exodus from Egypt, which is recorded in Exodus chapter 12. It was the month of Nisan, which is equivalent to our late March and early April. It took three days to make this trip from Nazareth. On their way back to Nazareth, Joseph and Mary thought that Jesus was with them. He was not with them. It says in verse 43, they were unaware of it. The Greek words are ukonosko, meaning that they did not know. So they went back to Jerusalem. They searched for three days and found him in the temple courts. This seems like a young person who is frustrating his parents. I know I did that plenty of times when I was a kid, but Jesus Christ is giving us an example of how to live our lives. When his astonished mother said to him, why have you treated us like this? Jesus responded, didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? The word for had to be is dei, which means it is necessary. If you want to be like Jesus Christ, here are three things you can do. Number one is ask questions. Jesus was asking questions of these learned men. You may be reading the Bible alone in the morning or in the evening. There are three important questions that you can ask after you've read a portion of the Bible. First, what is this passage telling me about God? Second, what should I stop doing? Third, what should I start doing? Not long ago, I was reading in Joshua about the Battle of Jericho. When I read that scripture, one of the things that it told me about God is that God is trustworthy. Another thing it told me is that I should do exactly what God tells me to do. And that's what Joshua did. He followed God's instructions right down to the letter. It told me that I should remember what we promised to do. If you're familiar with the story, you know that the Israelites conquered Jericho, but they spared the life of Rahab and her family because she protected Israel's spies who came to visit Jericho. If you've ever read the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew chapter one, you know that Rahab shows up there. She was the mother of Boaz. Imagine God's grace for just a moment when you think about Jesus' birth. A prostitute was in our Lord's ancestry. What an amazing thought that is. Secondly, you can spend time with people who are wise. When I was ordained in November of 1983, I was asked to say a few words at the end of the service. I kept it simple and I kept it quick because we'd all been there for a very long time. I looked into the faces of my two role models and this is what I said. I wanna be a minister like Revis Turner and I wanna be a Christian like Ralph Lamb. These were the two people in my life who knew the word of God and knew how to minister to others. From time to time, I think back on 1974, when I spent a few days in Xenia with the youth group that Revis led. The youth group was from First Baptist Church in Lima. We were cleaning up debris from the tornado that hit in 1974. While we were there, we camped out in the backyard of First Baptist Church of Xenia, and we would make a fire at night and sit around it and sing songs and pray prayers and read scripture. Being around Revis Turner taught me how to live for God. And interestingly enough, it was Ralph Lamb who got me to do those three days. Ralph persuaded me that the First Baptist Church of Lima youth group needed a little bit of extra help. And so I went there and hung out with them. I can remember a few things from when I was a teenager one of those things was playing tennis on the high school tennis team. One uh, day, our meet was with uh, Trotwood High School. And I was lucky enough to draw their number one player. 
His name was Bill. Bill was the star player on Trotwood's basketball team. He was really tall. He was about 6'8". And it was a little bit overwhelming to see him serve because when he tossed the ball up high and then hit it, it felt like it was coming down from the moon. Bill would serve and then run to the net and then I would try to hit the ball past him. But I couldn't do it because his reach was so long. He was so tall and so big that every time I tried to hit the ball past him, he would reach out and then win the point. That was one of the quickest matches I've ever played. I was beaten, I think, in a half an hour. And what it taught me is that God's reach through the Bible, which is what Jesus was talking about here on this day in the temple courts, reaches everything. The scriptures reach everything in my life. And that's how Ralph and Revis were to me. They reached everything in my life. The final thing that we get from this is to be in your father's house. That's what Jesus said to his mom. Don't you know I had to be in my father's house? It reminds us of what it says in Psalm 84 verse 10. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wicked. It's good to be in God's house, isn't it? We miss that while we're online. A lot of people look forward to being in the Lord's house because of people they care deeply about. Some people look forward to being in the Lord's house because it makes them feel like they're doing a good thing. You know why we should come to the Lord's house? We should come to the Lord's house to be with Jesus. For where two or three come together in my name, there am I with them, Matthew 18, 20. Jesus is right here with us. When I come to the table of the Lord, I sense God's presence. When I sing songs of praise, I sense God's presence. When I pray the Lord's prayer, I sense God's presence. What could be better than being in the presence of our Lord? We want to be with Jesus. We want to be with him forever. There may be someone listening this morning who has never asked Jesus Christ into his or her heart. This will be a wonderful time to begin that eternal relationship. Why should I do that? Because we read in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. In Romans 5, verse 8, we read, But God demonstrates his own love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. In Romans 6, 23, we read, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. In Romans 10, verse 9, we read that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Perhaps you'd like to say this prayer and invite Jesus Christ into your heart. Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I am a sinner and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I turn from my sins and invite you to come into my heart and life. I choose to trust and follow you as my Lord and Savior. In your name I pray, amen. For those of you who prayed that prayer, this is the beginning of eternity, an eternity spent with Jesus. You'll be in his house forever. During China's cultural revolution, Christians were often sentenced to hard labor in prison camps. Maintaining their faith was hard and expressing it was harder. But for one man, Christmas was not complete without communion. The significance of Jesus' birth and death made celebrating the Lord's Supper on a cold Christmas day worth the risk. Christmas 1961 found the prisoners working on earthen walls around rice paddies in zero degree temperature. 
Wind howled over the freezing ground. One prisoner approached his supervisor. Could he have some time off from work since it was Christmas? The guard gave him permission, warning him to beware the warden. The old man walked into a gully out of sight, out of the wind. He built a small fire and began to celebrate Christmas. A few minutes later, the friendly guard saw the warden headed straight for them. He hurried over to warn the old prisoner, just in time to see him sipping something from a chipped cup, eating a bite of bread. When the warden arrived, all he saw were a prisoner and a guard huddled by a small fire. But the prisoner had completed his Christmas celebration, not with a banquet or with sweets, but with a cold cup and a cold crust. It was communion. His celebration of Christmas demanded communion. The birth of God's son would leave us cold if not for the death of Jesus Christ, enfolding us in the warm glow of his mercy. Our celebration of his birth needs to be wrapped in the swaddling clothes of God's grace. Our awe at Advent is not just that he came at all, but that he came to be crucified. When I look at the table of the Lord, I'm reminded that he came for each and every one of us. We're all invited to this table. In Philippians 2 verse 8, we read, And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. I don't know if Jesus understood that when he was 12 years old, but I do know that he was asking questions and he was spending time with wise people and he was in his father's house. And that's what we should do. We should ask questions of God. We should spend time with wise people that God has placed in our lives. And we should always be in our father's house. That's where we'll draw close to God. That's where we'll grow. May we pray. We thank you, Lord, for this amazing story of Jesus in the temple when he was 12 years old. We thank you, Lord, that Jesus shows us how to live. We ask that you would help us draw near to you and to your word. Please teach us through the scriptures. Help us to read them and to know that you are speaking to us through them. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to celebrate the Lord's Supper, and we pray that you would bless us as we partake of this meal. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our communion hymn is called A Communion Hymn for Christmas. It's from 1 Corinthians 11:26. Proclaim the Lord's death until he comes.
Welcome to the table of the Lord. We read in scripture from 1 Corinthians 11, for I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us pray. We thank you for the body of Jesus Christ given on the cross for our sins. We thank you for this bread, which symbolizes his body. And we thank you, Lord, for our Savior's sacrifice on our behalf. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to remember him. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The body of Christ given for you. Take and eat. Amen. In the same way after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We thank you, our heavenly father, for the blood of Jesus. We thank you for this cup, which symbolizes his blood. We thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy. We thank you, Lord, that Jesus' blood covers all of our sins. Grateful are we, Lord, that we may partake of this cup and remember the death of Jesus, who died for our sins. We pray in his name, amen. The blood of Christ given for you. Drink. Amen.